How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? It's myself, Nasi Pizwane, back with another episode of Slow Genogon Podcast. Um, and today, I've got Paint Me in Colour, a really wonderful band from the UK, um, specifically Liverpool. It's not the first guest that we've had from Liverpool. We've had Simon Dale before. Shout out Simon Dale. And I'm extremely privileged and excited to be having this conversation with Paint Me in Colour. Now, guys, one of your singles has got over 17,000 streams on Spotify, which is absolutely incredible. How have you guys actually gone about getting such numbers um, on these streaming platforms and has it been rewarding you know having such high streams to sort of like a lot of artists that's not massive numbers but to sort of smaller artists like us i mean yeah that is like a higher streaming song yeah but i think it's just been a with that one every track you sort of every track you put out you don't really know how it's going to be received um i mean that track for us it was quite different to what we put out up until that point mm. and um we were just quite lucky it got it got on quite a few playlists and that, that yeah. that's the main thing that really helps artists these days is the playlist inside of things that's a very valid point in terms of being able to get on playlists um is this you know how do you sort of do that in practice do you actively seek out people that are going to playlist in music or are you sort of headhunted you know how does that sort of work it's been sort of like it's just we've been really lucky it's just been um people sort of i guess just sort of putting us on their playlist yeah yeah messaging us to be fair there was one guy that we emailed um to be on his playlist um, but I don't know how that. I don't, I don't know if it came of that, but I think yeah. we've been we've been really, really lucky and just sort of people putting us on their playlists. Mm. Obviously, we I think the the big ones are sort of if you can get on like a Spotify editorial, the uh, there we used, people sort of seem to really rack up the streams. Yeah. No, that's actually very brilliant. You know, what would you guys say? Um, the dynamics are between you know releasing music online you know, on the DSPs and sort of live performance, you know, do these numbers translate to an actual audience? Like, would we be able to go to a Paint Me and Colour show and see, say, maybe 17K people coming out to see you guys? Um, what are sort of the dynamics between that? No, no, it's a really good question because it is, it is quite, I don't know if you no, answer this one. But I was just going to say, like, it's not, it is. it doesn't translate as much, I don't think, in person, though. Like, um, so most gigs, I'll be honest, we're quite lucky if there's about... 150? Yeah, like, max, like, max. Um, and it's a shame because, you know, we want to reach a wider audience, but I think because our music's quite different, um, yeah, it's one of them, either people love it or they hate it. The streaming, the whole, like, streaming side, like, I find mm. it's, like, when you release music and who you put it out to, obviously you are putting it out to your, like, uh, your fans who sort of do follow you, like, I guess, like, your physical fan base, but... Um, so you are putting out for them, but it does feel like two different worlds. You you almost put it out to complete strangers. And you can have people, like, we'll get messages on social media and stuff and go, I love your music and we follow you, but we'll never meet these people. Yeah, yeah. Just because they live so far away or circumstance, one, one that probably never see us at a gig unless we sort of came to them. So it is, it is crazy how you can sort of have two different fan bases that never quite meet. Mm, it's absolutely beautiful. Liv, you mentioned there that the stuff that you guys make is very different. It's either you, you love it or you hate it. Um, so what has sort of been the general you know, feedback in terms of Paint Me and Colour and the music that you guys make? Uh, give me the best of both. What is sort of the best compliments you've received? And what has sort of been the worst sort of you know, criticism that you guys have received as a band? Uh, probably best uh, is, and it happens even from like when we first started out gigging to now is you're so different and like that's so, all we hear. yeah yeah and it's like and people think might think oh that's a bit of a rubbish compliment but we actually really love people saying that like are oh, you just so different like and they can't really put into words when you say well what makes what why do you think we're different because we'd like to know because <laughs> we don't actually feel like we're that unusual as a band because we just write how we feel and what kind of comes to mind but to other people listening they're like oh that's really unusual and i've not heard anything like that before and um which is quite nice isn't it um probably worst criticism i don't know i mean all criticism is great because you can learn from it but i think for a little while we our show lacked a little bit didn't it for a while um and that's something we really have like proper worked hard on making sure like it's spot on now and yeah. i think we're pretty happy with our show now and yeah. if anything that's like our main um what's uh what's the word like main usb like unique yeah selling. yeah like a selling point yeah like people if, if anything are actually like oh god these are really good live like it's a bit mad on what you put into the live shows 
I think, as you said, like I think it's hard to sort of pick a a worse criticism because I, don't know, I think you can just sort of grow from that. Yeah, know? yeah, definitely. So we, we never sort of really get to like you know we never really take it to heart. No, says. no. One thing that is very interesting about you guys is that you know here in South Africa the bands you need to actually do some research um, if you want to. When I say research, you need to actively go out and look for, you know, stuff that comes from the UK. Um, it's not readily available, like on radio and TV and all that there. And literally, some of the bands that I've only ever had access to this side would have been, you know, the likes of Catfish and the Bottle Men. And one thing that you pick up is that it, you can sort of tell that it's from the UK because of the accent. But with you guys, I couldn't pick up that accent uh, for some, like I can't listen to you guys and think you guys are from the UK. Is that deliberate? Does it just sort of happen? How do you go about doing that? If anything, I sometimes used to when I was younger, I used to sing quite American, and then I was like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not from America, so why am I singing with an American accent? And I, I toned that back, but I think because my accent, I don't think's too strong. It doesn't come come through in my singing, and I did always love uh, soul music. I, I still do love soul music, but. I like basically grew up on soul and jazz, so maybe that's where I I don't know. It's kind of like molded into that somewhere. Yeah, molded into it, into my voice somehow. I don't don't know, but and it's kind of neutralized my accent. I don't know when I say that. That's something we've never heard before. That is quite an interesting point. No one's ever sort of mentioned that to Mm -hmm. us. You know, it's really nice. I mean, one of the things as well that stands out with you guys is just the quality of some of your music videos as well. Pity Me um, is something that uh, I watched that and I was like, yo, it's absolutely incredible. It looks really good. Um, It looks like a band that is already, you know, headlining Glasto. So with you guys, how are you able, how are you able to pull off that caliber, you know, of a music video like Pity Me? What sort of planning went behind that? How many hours went into that? The budget? Uh, give me sort of like a breakdown of that. So our budget for that video was actually, I think, it was like sort of silly, like forty pounds. I think all in all, if, yeah, if that, if that. Well, George, our bassist, he's a videographer. He did all the directing and the video and of it. And then we're very lucky that we have. We, so we, we produce a lot of our own music and stuff like that. And yeah. we, we do, and we rehearse. It's all in like our own room that we sort of rent on a monthly basis. And again, a lot of our music videos that you see, they're all shot in the same room. Yeah. But each video, we just sort of do something different. So for pity me, all the shots that look like they're in like a cardboard room, it's the same room that we use for like the Like You video. If you've seen that, where we made it look like a bedroom. But we went to and went to a supermarket yeah. and just sort of said to them, "Can we can we have any spare cardboard that you have?" And we sort of just sellotaped it all to the wall. And that was so like last minute because we we were meant to hire somewhere and then that place wasn't available and. You know, because we're not a signed band and don't have kind of like the the budget there, we were like, we're gonna have to just use our room again, and we just literally thought on the spot, right, cardboard, sellotape, yeah. and just <laughs> and just did that. What has sort of driven you guys to sort of sticking to the genre that you're doing and not maybe get tempted to go where the mainstream sort of market is and the main sort of pull is? In terms of like sticking with a genre, whether you feel like you're popular or not. That's just sort of what comes natural. Yeah. I think even if we wanted to try and follow whatever's trendy or I don't think we could. I don't think it's it wouldn't not sincere. Yeah, it wouldn't turn out very well. And and then even if we followed it through and played it live, I think we're all a strong believer in if we're into it, then like we've got to be the first people who are into it. And if we're not into it, then there's no way you're ever gonna convince an audience or a fan base. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you know, we want nothing more than to be like in the hits and and be managed or signed. It's like a and dream. Be popular. Yeah, and be popular, yeah. But it's you know, I think we're we're just sticking by the thing of if we keep grafting and we keep trying, hopefully someone might see what we see in us and will want to be a part of it would you say that's the end goal then maybe to get signed eventually um at the same time it's sort of like getting signed would maybe mean sacrificing some of that creative freedom um in terms of the stuff that you're doing so what would you say the ultimate goal is for you guys Ooh. it's really hard especially in today's industry yeah uh, if you have a, a stance on it but I'd sort of say there's definitely a big sort of independent movement more and more bands are sort of like, oh, we're doing it independently uh, I think a, a big step for us is we'd love to get managed. We just sort of have, have like that. Have, we'd like to have that professional guidance and advice on like how to sort of like navigate through the industry. Yeah. Because I know sometimes we've sort of 
made decisions or done things which we've sort of regretted or went on oh, maybe we should have in hindsight yeah yeah we should have done that a separate way so that'd be a big step for us and i think also we'd love to have some sort of booking agent so we can sort of get the bigger shows and i know where we really feel that our live show is so strong that a bit of our way of sort of growing would be to just keep playing to bigger and bigger audiences yeah it's actually funny there's a there's a, a booking agent slash publicist that um i work with on the show who his name is Llewellyn screen he used to stay here south africa he recently moved to the uk um and he has started sort of getting you know some clients that are working with him in terms of you mentioned booking agents and i thought of him uh maybe it's a bit of like a nudge in that direction if you guys are needing that but um, <laughs> just moving on swiftly how do you guys sort of deal with an unresponsive crowd because obviously as musicians the journey it's sort of like a roller coaster journey you're going to get uh, gigs where people absolutely love you and go crazy for you and then you get gigs where people don't really respond how do you sort of take it on the chin and you know how do you deal with that situation it- it's tough you know like some some gigs don't get me wrong like you, you like we played uh an award show a while back and that was to like 700 people and that was for liverpool the first liverpool award show and it was great it was like the biggest audience we've ever played to and felt like such on a high like yeah and from this we're gonna get so many opportunities and like we did we did get a couple of opportunities but it was way less than we kind of thought. It is a bit disheartening when that happens and you kind of go, okay, back to the grind, back to kind of the same venue that we've played a million times. I'm 25 now and Sam's uh, tw- <laughs> 24. I don't forgot your age. Um, and, you know, you, you've you just got to think, well, if it's what we want to do, we've been doing it for long enough now that we, we love music so much that it's not worth giving it up. No. I just don't think the passion's just too too there. We've played a few gigs where we've finished a song and we've like really enjoyed playing because regardless if like there's four people in the crowd or forty, we've always had the mentality of play it like it's your last show, regardless. It doesn't matter because you don't know who is in the crowd. So we all get geared up and we're jumping around. We finish a song and and then you get the audience who are just like. And it is, it is awkward and you kind of just kind of like, <laughs> next song, quick, just play the next song. <laughs> and it is awful because it makes you feel so awkward and you just go home and you go, why am I doing this? But why are you doing it? It outweighs money and it, like stuff like that, it, like the passion for actually just playing together and that kind of like magical feeling when you, it sounds cheesy, but it's kind of like a magical feeling when we all play together. Yeah, it's definitely a feeling that you can't replicate no. throughout and else. And I think as well, I think, just through like playing a lot of gigs now we've sort of learned what what moments in this if you were to play to an audience that are pretty flat like yeah. where are the moments in the set where it might become awkward and we've sort of we found ways to get around that so yeah we have like interludes and stuff don't yeah we? so we have like weird little electronic sort of yeah interludes i guess uh, so there's not like that really awkward silence where the bait of hail is just like going across <laughs> no that's really solid and i mean you guys there are a couple of live performance videos that you guys have on your youtube and you the chemistry that you guys have on stage is absolutely incredible i feel like it's it's one of those things that just comes with time how did you guys actually get together because just looking at that chemistry in those videos you can just see this is beyond just work and just a band you can feel that it's more you know, you can feel that it's uh, you guys are like mates, you know, behind the scenes as well. So, how did this actually come together? Um, well, it's hard, and it's you, you um, were so our guitarist Matt and Sam, you were in a band originally, weren't you? That was like your baby. Yeah, we've known each other now for about 12 years. Yeah, we're in a relationship, so I was actually uh, playing covers um, for a little while, and I needed a, a drummer. And I was dating Sam at the time, so I was like, right. It sort of made sense. Yeah, it made sense. And um, we started playing together, and um, your band at the time with Matt was kind of breaking down a little bit, wasn't it? Um, I think it's just people growing up and things like that. It kind of went different ways. And Matt was free, and I, I asked Sam, would, you, would Matt want to be a part of my band? And it was a solo artist. It was kind of intended to be that. But I did feel like the lads weren't putting their heart in it, just purely because when it's a solo artist and a backing band, you are kind of just supporting the artist. And it's kind of on the artist to come up with all the creative aspects of, of, of it. And I didn't want that. I wanted like a band that every single person would be like, this is the best part I've played. This is the best you know whatever like my part like their part is just as important as my part and they know they're putting their name on it yeah exactly yeah yeah i wanted it to feel like everybody's baby not just mine so we asked matt and then 
we actually for a while played the three of us uh, with bass on a backing track. It was like a year, was it? Yeah. And then we eventually found George, and uh, it was a, a quite a big decision, wasn't it? Getting a bassist because we were so scared. We were so sort of, like close in it. Yeah, it's... like the three of us. We were so like, oh god, like what if we bring in someone new, like, and they don't get our humour, and because we are a bit strange <laughs> and like we thought oh god he's gonna think we're weirdos but now he fits right in he's yeah. he's just as weird as us isn't he george and yeah it's just kind of gone from there really you guys made the right choices in terms of the people that are in the band because it's absolutely incredible like just seeing you guys and how you guys are live um through those videos and how the band sounds when it comes to just the recorded stuff you know that's out there for you live what are sort of the dynamics i asked this to to alana joy shout out to her out in cape town um being the the only female assigned body in the band does that come with any challenges because an example i also made in the alana episode is that like being in a band myself, we always just play the fool. It's never like a serious moment. It's always just, you know, shots at each other and all that there. Uh, what are the dynamics for you being a female in a band full of guys? I'll be honest. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably uh, just more, sometimes more of a guy than the, the other three. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. I've always got on with guys as friends. Um sometimes better than females just because you know females can be sometimes a little bit bitchy and things like that I just feel like I've I've always just got on more with guys and um and I'll be honest the other two obviously Sam's my boyfriend but uh, Matt and George they literally just feel like my brothers and and so I can just burp and be stupid and just be one of the lads in front of them like it doesn't really matter i think it's one of them as well and i think you don't ever feel awkward if we made you feel that way but yeah it's just not it's more like a family it's... yeah yeah literally and then we and even though we're in a relationship it never feels like us and them it it always feels like we you know we're very good at making it feel like we're just all friends together when, when you know, we're not like all over each other like in front of the other two it's you know it, we are good at separating that, aren't we, really? No, that's really solid. And what would you guys say is the biggest challenge you've encountered as musicians and how do you sort of get over it? So you just sort of like cutting through quite like, a, as I said before, like an industry that's so saturated with like, not in a, not even in a negative way, like some amazing music. Yeah, but yeah. It's very saturated and coming from, in the grand scheme of things, Liverpool's quite a small city and it's definitely got sort of like, um, you know, it's got clicks of people who Definitely. sort of stick together. Yeah. So just sort of like trying to break out of that um, and sort of get opportunity outside of Liverpool. I was going to say, that's been the hardest thing. I think we got a few gigs in London, like a couple in Camden, which was a really great opportunity for us, wasn't it really? Because we'd been trying for so long, but it's trying to make sure that rolling ball keeps going. Trying to win people yeah. over. No, listen, on the track that you guys are on, I have no doubt that, you know, the fan base is going to grow. The music is on point. The live performance is on point. The aesthetics are on point. I'm very interested now, on the side, how did you guys submit? You submitted to the show. and Did you guys know it was a South African show? Or is it like, uh, oh no, shit, it's South African, but we've already submitted, so it's like, uh. To be fair, like, like cause it was me submitted, I did know it was a South African show. I think I saw saw you guys on Instagram. I thought, oh, that seems, that seems pretty cool. Let's see that's sort of how that came yeah. about. That's really cool. It's very, it was very interesting, you know, finding, you know, the submission. It's it's really awesome. And you guys looked the part, and you guys are awesome, so I had to find out more about you. Um, But sort of now, towards the end, um, what would you guys say the plans are? You know, when it comes to releases, um, I know "Ugly" is is one of the songs that's that's out at the moment, which is absolutely brilliant. So what else can you sort of expect from you guys for the remainder of the year? Well, we want to try and have another is it two singles, uh, maybe one. We'll def- see. We'll definitely have another, <laughs> another single out by the end of the year. Um, and a couple of uh, music videos as well. We're um, planning as well. And then we've got a, a headline show, which we're really trying to push at the moment. Headline show on the twenty third of September. A place called the Quarry. That's in Liverpool. That's for all Liverpool-based peeps. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in, in terms of like uh, music and stuff like that, we are definitely going to try and get another single out and mu- yeah. a, a music video. Before I let you guys go, you obviously mentioned a show there that's coming up at the Quarry. So, what is the best way to prepare for playing a show at a venue like the Quarry as well? Um. Well, we actually like we we. Like Sam said earlier, we have lots of like interludes, so like little musical breaks and things like that, um, which makes it feel like a whole collective. And when we're like writing out the set of like, right, okay, we're writing our headline set out, 
we'll plan like where those interludes are going to go where it'll kind of dip where we want the the actual set to dip so people feel different emotions while they're watching us um and sam <laughs> is a bit meticulous like so while we're playing if we are like we play one thing wrong he's like no again do it again do it again do it again we're very like it's like you know like a workhorse <laughs> um until until it's perfect really like until until we're we're really happy with it and we, we've just been doing that in haven't we yeah. each week now uh just bashing out the set now that is really solid guys i'm wishing you all the best for that gig and with all the releases that you guys have planned and everything that you guys wanted to do for the remainder of the year um before we get you guys' handles drop some advice what is the best piece of advice you'd give any creative out there that is making music don't give up yeah. You know, if, if there's something inside you that's like, you know, you wake up every morning and that's what you want to do for the rest of your life, then just don't give up. Even if you feel like you get loads of set, setbacks, you know, just keep keep like reminding yourself why why you want to do it. No words have been true, guys. Thank you for joining me on the show. For anyone who wants to contact you or get in touch, what are your social media handles for them? So on Instagram, it's at Paint Me and Colour and TikTok's the same. Uh, and we've got a website. It's uh, pigmentcolor.com. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That is cool, guys. So what song should we play out with for anyone who isn't familiar with your guys' sound? Ooh. Should we do so our latest single? Yeah. So that's our latest single, uh, Ugly. So you guys are going to play out with Ugly by Paint Me and Color. It's been a very epic chat. Thank you for joining myself and them on the episode. We hope you learned a lot about them and hopefully picked up some gems for yourself that you can apply in your career. Um, and obviously for all things Sledge Underground, it's www.sledgeunderground.com. Uh, that's where pretty much everything is on Instagram at Sledge Underground, on Twitter at Sledge Earthy One, on Facebook, Sledge Underground Podcast. Until next time, enjoy Ugly by Paint Me and Color. Bye for now. Am I the only one who hates the mirror? Counting calories and losing my sanity. Dress sizes don't come in happy. Are you okay? Are you feeling alright? He nods his head and tries to understand. Empty compliments and vacant stares.